So today is Saturday, September 6, 2014. Okay, we'll begin with the homage to the Buddha. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa Okay, good morning everybody. What class of chitta is what we're up to today? Oh no, this is a sutta class. <laughs> okay, so we've been looking at Machimanikaya Sutta number 119. This is the discourse on mindfulness of the body. And the last time we did very briefly mindfulness of breathing, then we did the full, the, uh, the four postures. <laughs> now there's competition. So we did the four postures and the section on here is translated full awareness, but I prefer clear comprehension. Okay, now we come to the section on what is called the meditation on foulness or on the parts of the body. In the commentarial tradition, this is actually what is called the mindfulness directed to the body, kayakata sati. It's also sometimes called patikula sanya, that is the perception of the repulsiveness of the body. But often in the suttas it's referred to as the asubha sanya, that's the perception of the non-beautiful or unattractive nature of the body. Okay, so here the text explains that again a bhikkhu, a monk, or actually it's any practitioner, reviews, reviews the same body, that means one's own body, up from the soles of the feet and down from the top of the hair, bounded by skin, as full of many, as full of many kinds of impurity thus and by the word impurity here, as suci, it's not impurity in a moral sense, but things which are, maybe we could say, aesthetically unattractive. So, in this body there are head hairs, body hairs, nails, teeth, skin, flesh, sinews, bones, bone marrow, kidneys, heart, liver, diaphragm, spleen, lungs, intestines, mesentery, contents of the stomach, feces, bile, phlegm, pus, blood, sweat, fat, tears, grease, spittle, snot, oil of the joints, and urine. So actually if you count the parts here, there are 31 parts, but in the traditional way of practice, the brain, which is not included in the list here for some reason, is added. And so the usual way this is usual way this is practiced is with 32 parts of the body. And the brain is added after <laughs> after feces <laughs> before, before the bile. <laughs> ok, 
okay, if you look at the work called the Visuddhi Mukha, that's the path of purification, the main treatise in the Theravada tradition on the different subjects of meditation, this subject is explained in a very complex way, or complicated way. I think the way intended for those who are, wish to make this their full-time meditation subject. So first one has to learn all of the parts by rote, and then one has to review the parts by going through them in a particular sequence. And I have a little, I have to say, a little disagreement with the Visuddhi Magga method, because the method the Visuddhi Magga recommends goes like this. One starts off with head hairs, body hairs, nails, teeth, skin. Then one goes backwards, skin, teeth, nails, body hairs, head hairs. Then one goes again in forward order from head hairs, body hairs, nails, teeth, skin. Then one brings in flesh, sinews, bones, bone marrow, bone marrow kidneys, heart. Then one goes from heart I'm sorry, flesh, sinews, bones, bone marrow, kidneys, then one goes from kid kidneys back to head hairs, from head hairs back up to kidneys, then one brings in heart, liver, diaphragm, spleen, lungs, then from lungs back to head hairs, then from head hairs up to lungs, then one adds intestines, mesentery, contents of the stomach, feces, brain, and from brain back, back to head hairs, and from head hairs forward to brain, then one brings in bile, phlegm, pus, blood, sweat, and from sweat back to head hairs, from head hairs forward to sweat, then one brings in fat, tears, grease, spittle, snot, oil of the joints, and urine. Then from urine, back to head hairs, and from head hairs, forward to urine. But in this way, you keep on bringing in, it seems to give dispro disproportionate emphasis to those items that occur earlier in the list, whereas those that come later in the list only get hit a few times. You know, if you were keeping like a counter, like they do on the computer, to see how many hits a website gets, the first five would get hit, you know, eight times, something like that, eight to ten times, whereas the last ones would only get hit three. So it seems to have, one should have a balanced attention to each of the parts. So I found a more reasonable way to do it was to go from head hairs okay, up to skin, from skin back to head hairs, then from head hairs, then you go to flesh, sinews, bones, bone marrow, kidneys, and from kidneys back to flesh, and from flesh up to heart, liver, diaphragm, spleen, lungs, and from lungs back to heart, and from heart up to lungs, then from intestine, then intestines, mesentery, contents of the stomach, feces, brain, and from brain back to intestines, from intestines up to brain, then feces, bile, phlegm, pus, blood, sweat, fat, fat, then from fat back to bile, from bile up to fat, then tears, grease, spittle, snot, oil of the joints, and urine, then from urine back to tears, then from tears forward to urine. In this way, each part gets hit equally three times. And then according to the Visuddhi Magga method, one is supposed to review each part as repulsive, 
in terms, I think that there were five aspects, let's see, in terms of the color, shape, <laughs> odor, each part individually, <laughs> location, and the environment, that is, the surrounding parts. But this seems to make it so, as I said, so complex that it's rather difficult to practice. <laughs> and how is a practitioner going, <laughs> going to get the distinct smell of taking out the spleen, taking the <laughs> pulling out the stomach, getting a clear sense of how that smells differently from the spleen, <laughs> then opening up the skull and taking out the brain, <laughs> getting a good sniff of that. <laughs> so at least for sort of practical, everyday usage, I think it's sufficient to get just a general sense of the repulsiveness and the appearance of the part. Of course, if you have a chance to view an autopsy, then you get a chance. I think it's sufficient to get <laughs> the odor or the fragrance <laughs> of a body that has been cut open with you know, the different juice of fluids coming out. You know, we used to, confession, we used to do this in Sri Lanka. Some of us uh, monks, we would go to the autopsy room in the Colombo General Hospital, and since the doctor in charge of that room at the time, this was the early, mid-1980s, was a, a Buddhist, and so when Buddhist monks come knocking at the autopsy room, he welcomes them in, and he's happy to help them to learn as many of the 32 parts as they can get. And so I remember a few times when they <laughs> roll the body out, and it really looks like a person sound asleep. You know, you don't get a sense that it's a dead body, but then the doctor takes the, <laughs> the scalpel <laughs> and cuts into the flesh, pulls it open, and I want to shout out, don't do it, it's alive. <laughs> he or she is alive. <laughs> But then he starts, after cutting it open, pulling out, this, this is the heart, these are the lungs, this is the stomach, and it'll reach deep inside and starts pulling something out. <laughs> it looks like he's taking out a fire hose. <laughs> these are the intestines. <laughs> And then the most, I guess, the most dramatic moment is when they take this, it's, it's a particular name for a kind of saw. It's not the saw like this. It's shaped like a rectangle, and the blade is, one face is the blade. Do you remember, anybody know the name for that kind of saw? Band saw. Band saw. Band saw. Yeah. yeah. So they starts so cutting open the skull, and then at a certain point he just you know, gives it a knock, and the top of the skull opens up. <laughs> he reaches in and takes out the brains. <laughs> says, "These are the brains." <laughs> I remember one time I had gone for an autopsy together with this English monk who lived a very austere, ascetic type of life. Like he didn't stay in a fixed residence, but he would go walking th all around the country, you know, just staying from time to time at one monastery, another for a few days, a few weeks, then continue on his walking tour, always going on Pindapata, on arms round. So very tough, austere monk. 
you know, I'm sort of the little scholar monk. But when we were watching the autopsy together, I was watching with absorbed interest. But we were both standing up. But he said to the doctor, um, do you have a chair? <laughs> I'm feeling a little bit faint. <laughs> and then when this autopsy was almost over, the doctor's wife came in, <laughs> all dolled up with like <laughs> lipstick and makeup. <laughs> and she said, she sort of saw what we were doing, and I said, oh, when you first see it, <laughs> It's somewhat troublesome, but after a while you get used to it, then it's nothing. <laughs> okay, so anyway, this is, I would suggest, it's very useful for doing this meditation. The main purpose for, the main reason why the Buddha taught this meditation is for the practice, or for the purpose of reducing and eventually overcoming sensual lust, lust for, especially for sexual enjoyment. Because the desire for sexual enjoyment thrives on the basis of what is called supasanya, which means the perception of beauty, the perception of the body as being something beautiful and attractive. And so eventually, to overcome sensual lust, one has to overcome that perception of the body as being intrinsically attractive. And though this has to be overcome in relation to the bodies of others, but the Buddha doesn't suggest to the young monk, begin with the beautiful girl that you see on arms round, because if he begins with the beautiful girl that he sees on arms round, he'll be thinking hair of the head, hair of the body, nails, teeth, oh what a charming smile she had, um, skin, oh such nice shiny skin. Okay, then going back to the hair of the head, oh those tresses that were blowing in the wind, just a little bit covering the eye. Oh, how beautiful, how wonderful. Let me drop her a... <laughs> <laughs> drop her a, a, a message or give her a phone call. And so one begins with one's own body, because that's the safest place to begin. And so one has to get a sort of clear perception of the unattractive nature of one's own body. Then after one builds up sort of strength with one's own body, then one can begin to bring the body of somebody else in, but not the person who one feels a sexual attraction to, but could be just an ordinary person. And maybe at the very end, when one really has strong development, one could experiment a little, bringing in an attractive person. And if one is doing this just as a supplement to one's regular practice, I find it sufficient to go through the list, the way I said, like in groups generally of five and six parts, to go through in forward order and in reverse order, doing it according to the method so that you touch each part three times. And it doesn't bring its results immediately, like any meditation subject, it's something that one has to practice repeatedly over a long period. But when one does it repeatedly, then one gets a real sense of the intrinsically unattractive nature of the body. And it's not intended to generate a kind of emotional repugnance to the body, or a kind of disgust, an emotional disgust with the body. But when it's practiced, and in fact, if a person 
starts to give rise to those kinds of thoughts of emotional disgust with the body, then this is not the appropriate meditation subject for them, or it's not the appropriate time for them to practicing that to be practicing that meditation subject. Rather, a person who has the emotional disgust towards the body, I think that person by temperament should be developing something like loving kindness meditation. But it's a person who has tends to have a strong passionate interest in the body, strong sexual desire, for whom this is recommended as a full-time meditation subject. But generally it's useful for anybody who wants to live the celibate life of a monastic, or even in Sri Lanka on the Uposita days, that is the days of the full moon, when many people go to the temples and monasteries to observe the eight precepts. Many of them practice this meditation. Another benefit of this meditation subject, apart from reducing sexual desire, is that it reduces pride or conceit in one's own body. So this is why it's also useful for a person who has maybe somebody who's beautiful, handsome, very shapely woman with a very shapely figure, a man with a very muscular body, very handsome. Because if one does this, then one sees what is this body that I'm so proud of, that I am braiding myself as being more beautiful, more handsome, more attractive than others. One sees this body is just a collection of these parts, and if you take these parts, lay them out individually, there's nothing attractive about them, nothing to be proud about them. Am I so proud about my lungs? About my heart? My stomach? Look, I have the most beautiful stomach in, <laughs> in Putnam County. <laughs> I have the most sweet and charming large intestines. <laughs> Look at those curves in my intestines, those <laughs> really sexy curves. <laughs> <laughs> Winner of the gold ribbon three years in a row. <laughs> I have to blow my nose into the handkerchief. and give it to you and you can take it home and frame it. <laughs> okay, so then to illustrate the way one is to look at the body, the Buddha says, just as though there were a bag with an opening at both ends full of many sorts of grain, such as different kinds of rice, hill rice, red rice, beans, peas, millet, and white rice, and then a man with good eyesight were to open it and to look at it thus, and he were to distinguish the different types of grains and peas. And in the same way the monk reviews the same body is full of many kinds of impurity thus. Okay, and then he continues with the refrain, refrain passage, as he abides thus diligent, ardent, and resolute, his memories and intentions based on the household life or the worldly life are abandoned, 
and with their abandoning, his mind becomes steady, internally quieted, brought to singleness and concentrated. This is how a bhikkhu develops mindfulness of the body. And I should, yeah, I should add the short way to do this meditation. But what the Bisuti Mata recommends is that as one is going through the 32 parts, as one is doing it over and over, at a certain point, certain parts will stand out sort of more clearly, more distinctly to one's mental perception. Other parts will be more vaguer and more obscure. And so at that point, one drops the more obscure parts and just retains the more prominent parts, say five or six prominent parts, and goes through those until out of those five or six parts, one part stands out as more prominent. Then one just chooses that one part and focuses exclusively on that. And so, I know monks in Sri Lanka who practice this meditation, generally they wind up focusing on the one part that they retain is the skeleton. And in meditation monasteries in Sri Lanka, in one room or another, generally there will be a real skeleton hanging. It would be the skeleton that they've obtained from the hospital, or maybe from, you know, they've obtained a skeleton from the hospital. Someplace they obtain a, a skeleton, they have the skeleton hanging there. So somebody who wants to practice this meditation can go there and view the skeleton, get the impression of the skeleton, and then go back to their room to meditate on it. But to do this meditation in a more compressed way, what I found useful is just to take four or five parts. What I've done is to take the skin, the flesh, it's the muscles, then just take the internal organs comprehensively, bones and blood, and then go back from blood, bones, internal organs, flesh, and the skin. So if one wants to practice this, one could experiment with different ways. It's good at the beginning to go through all 32 parts, hitting each part three times by taking them in groups of five or six. Okay, and so the purpose of the meditation on the unattractive nature of the body is to help to overcome sensual desire and also pride or conceit with regard to the body. Okay, now we have <coughs> a meditation subject which is somewhat similar to the meditation on the unattractive nature of the body except that there's a different perspective that is adopted. This is the meditation on the elements. And so here the text reads, Again, bhikkhus, a bhikkhu reviews the same body, however it is placed, however disposed, as consisting of elements thus, and when the text says, however it is placed, however it is disposed, this means that one could do this meditation on the elements in any posture. So it's not confined to the sitting posture, though generally at the outset one could build up sort of more momentum with it by starting with the sitting posture. But eventually one could do it while engaged in walking back and forth, even in lying down. But one reviews this body as consisting of elements thus. In this body there are the earth element, the water element, the fire element, and the air element. And then the Buddha gives a simile, 
just as though a skilled butcher or his apprentice had killed a cow and was seated at the crossroads with it cut up into pieces, so too the monk reviews the same body, however it is placed, however disposed, as consisting of elements thus. In this body, there are the earth element, water element, fire element, and the air element. Okay, so in practical terms, how is this meditation subject to be practiced? There are actually two methods of practicing this subject two general <clears throat> methods. One is the concise but somewhat more difficult method and then there is the more detailed but somewhat easier method. The more detailed or easier method works with 42 aspects of the body rather than the 31 or 32 in the meditation on the foulness of the body. And we see this 32-fold method, I'm sorry, the 42-fold method in the Buddha's instructions to his son Rahula in Sutta number 62. Okay, now, oops, sort of philosophically, that is in the Abhidharmic sense, well actually this is in agreement with the suttas also, the four great elements are present in all material substances, but different material substances have a prominence of one element or another. And so when one takes the parts of the body, even though in all the parts of the body all four elements are present, but certain parts of the body more distinctively will represent one element rather than another. So here, this, I'm on page 528 now, the Buddha is explaining to Rahula how to meditate on the elements in the detailed way, taking different parts of the body or different bodily processes to represent different elements. So first, in section 8, he takes the earth element. So he explains Whatever internally belonging to oneself is solid, solidified, and clung to, and just go to the end of that sentence, this is called the internal earth element. And then what is representing the earth element are the parts of the body starting from the head hairs and the body hairs, down through nails, teeth, skin, and then continuing to the contents of the stomach, the feces, and then the tradition will add the brain. So here we have, I think, 20 parts representing the earth element. Okay, then to take the water element, one takes those parts of the body, or components of the body, that are fluid in nature. And so here the Buddha brings up the question, what is the water element? The water element may be either internal or external, but since this is mindfulness of the body, one is just focusing on the internal aspect. So what is the internal water element? Whatever internally belonging to oneself is water, watery and clung to, or whatever we can say is liquid, liquidish, and clung to. This is called the internal water element. And these are the, I think it's 12 parts, bile, phlegm, pus, blood, sweat, 
fat, tears, grease, spittle, snot, oil of the joints, and urine, or anything else internally that is liquid. So all that is the water element. Then to take the fire element, the fire element again may be either internal or external, but here we're concerned, since it's a mindfulness of the body, we're concerned with the internal fire element. So what is it? Whatever internally belonging to oneself is fire, fiery, or we could say hot, and clung to, This is called the internal fire element, and this is explained under, I think it's six aspects. That by which one is warmed, so we all have a fixed body temperature. Generally it's in the neighborhood of 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. So that is considered a manifestation of the fire element. And it's that by which one ages. This is part of the Indian physiology that it's maybe because they observe that when fruit gets warm it starts to decay and so the fire element is considered to be that which causes the body to age. It's the heating up of the body that causes the body to age and that by which one is consumed Probably this is referring when one gets a fever that occurs through a flaring up of the fire element in the body. And that by which one is eaten, drunk, consumed and tasted gets completely digested. And so it's the fire element which is seen to have the role of digesting the food. So we have that which is transformed, ages and consumed. And that there's actually four processes mentioned here. I think I said six, but these are four. And so those are the four manifestations of the fire element. And then whatever else internally belonging to oneself is fire or fireish, <coughs> hot and clung to. So all that is called the internal fire element. And then we come to the air element or the wind element. And so what is the air element? The air element may be either internal or external, and we're taking only the internal air element. So that is whatever is whatever internally belonging to oneself is air, airy, and clung to. This is the internal <coughs> air element. And so these are said to be, the air, internal air element is said to consist of the upgoing winds, downgoing winds, winds or air in the belly, air in the bowels, the winds that course through the limbs, and according to the ancient Indian system of physiology, what we would now call nerve impulses, both sensory nerve impulses and motor impulses. The sensory nerve impulses are the nervous currents by which we are able to perceive things, and the motor nerve currents are the currents by which we move the body and activate the body. So now we speak in terms of nerve currents or neurotransmitters, but in ancient Indian physiology those were held to be activities of the winds of the body. And those winds were considered aspects of the air element. Does anybody here know Ayurvedic medicine, the Indian system of medicine? You do? Is that held to be the case? In okay. Okay, so these are the 
the winds that course through the limbs, and then of course the most obvious manifestation of the air element or wind element is in-breathing and out-breathing. Okay, so one takes this as representing the air element, and then one goes through all of these, this whole process of reviewing the body again and again in terms of the parts that represent the earth element, the parts that represent the water element, parts or functions that represent the fire element, and the functions that represent the air element. So that is the sort of the detailed, more comprehensive way of doing the meditation on the elements. But at a certain point, then one could switch over to the more concise, sort of more concentrated, more powerful way of doing the meditation on the elements. And that is to go directly into the, or to pick up on the distinctive characteristic of each element. And so the way this is, would be done is to take, okay, for the earth element, the distinctive characteristic is hardness or solidity. And there's actually a spectrum moving from hardness to softness along representing different degrees of intensity of the earth element. And so one would begin by taking something hard in the body, which one could feel to get a sense of the hardness. So one could take one's teeth and strike them together to see how the teeth are hard, or one could feel a particular bone, where the bone comes close to the skin, the elbow, for example, the fingernails. Or the bones of the ankles. Okay, so one begins with a sense of hardness, which one picks up by actual touch. And then one starts moving through the body to feel hardness throughout the body. And generally, to be able to move into this method of practicing meditation on the elements, one needs either a pretty strongly focused mind, initially through something like mindfulness of breathing, or else one should have done the more extended, more complicated method of reflection on the elements first. Of course, if we just sit down and try to get that sense of hardness, it's very difficult. And even with a well-concentrated mind, one has to go through the process over and over. Initially, as one goes through, one, a lot of the parts won't stand out clearly as hard, but just occasionally one will start to pick up the sense of hardness at certain points. Maybe as one is going through from the top of the head, one could start to feel the hardness there or the solidity. Then one starts moving down the body, sort of in increments, till one is coming through the head, down the neck, then along the shoulders, well, each shoulder in turn, right, shoulder, say, down, Us, the biceps, the upper part of the arm, the lower part of the arm, the hand, the fingers, then do it with the left arm, then go down from again from the neck through the chest to the belly, then down the back from the neck, down the back, then down the buttocks, then over to the pubic area, even down the genitals, then down the legs, the thighs, the knees, the shins, the ankles, the feet, the toes, 
trying always to pick up the sense of hardness or solidity. And one has to keep on doing this over and over. It's a process of bhavana, of cultivation, until gradually the perception of solidity begins to stand out more and more clearly, until one could actually sort of scan the body. And it's almost like one is getting that sense of hardness and solidity throughout the whole body, as though one is picking up like grains of sand throughout the body. And then one could go to the other aspect of the earth element, softness. One takes a soft part of the body, like the flesh, of maybe the upper arm, or the belly, wherever one could feel softness. And then one starts, in a similar way, scanning the body to get the sense of softness, and picking up the sense of softness throughout the body. Okay, so in this way one is starting to perceive the earth element in terms of hardness and softness. Then to get the liquid element, there are two ways to approach the liquid element, the water element. One is through the characteristic of flowing, or maybe just call it simply liquidity. So where does one get the sense of flowing? Basically, I could think of two places, or two ways. Yeah, exactly. When one is sitting in a meditation room, the place where you can get the sense of flowing is most clearly is in the mouth. There's another place where you can get it, but I don't suggest picking up on that in the meditation room. It could be very embarrassing for oneself and troublesome for others. Yeah, so one could begin just by getting a sense of the saliva in the mouth. And then one would get that sort of tactile sense of flowing or liquidity, then one starts exploring the rest of the body to pick up the sense of liquidity. Okay, then the other aspect of the liquid element is, this is according to the commentarial style or Abhidhamic style of explanation, is that the liquid element has the function of cohesion. It is a binding together the particles of the earth element. And so one gets a sense of how the body coheres, how the, between the par- particles in the body there is this binding together. And one could actually, as the mind becomes more sensitive, one could get a sense of how the body is being sort of, co- how the body is cohesive throughout the whole body, from the top of the head all the way down to the soles of the feet. And this is representing the cohesive function of the water element. Okay, then comes the fire element. And to pick up the fire element, one has to again sort of explore the body and see The fire element is represented by the characteristics of heat, where there's a preponderance of the fire element, and coolness, where there is a deficiency or weakness of the fire element. So generally one would begin with the parts where you feel heat in the body is prominent. So one will just sit and just start attending to the body. It can be either the internal heat of the body, or if when it's the hot climate is hot, the weather is hot, you feel the hotness around the body. But one picks up a clear perception of heat, and then one starts exploring the body internally to get a sense of the hotness, the natural bodily temperature, which is diffused throughout the whole body. And so one starts moving from the top of the head down through the face, the neck, shoulders, arms, trunk of the body, legs, 
down to the feet, experiencing the heat throughout the whole body. And then if there's any coolness becomes manifest, then you note that as a deficiency or weakness in the fire element. Okay, then the air element, where is one going to pick it up most clearly and distinctly? Yeah, in the in and out breathing. And so one those can start by attending to the in and out breathing. But this is done in a different way from mindfulness of breathing. <coughs> the objective here is not to be following each in-breath and each out-breath is continuously and consistently as possible, but to get a sense of motion, of movement, which is the distinctive mark of the air element. Also it's said the air element has the characteristic of distension, that is of ex sort of expanding out and then contracting in, expanding, contracting. And so one starts off with the in-breath and out-breath, but one could spread the attention throughout the body as one is breathing in and out. And one starts to notice that as one is breathing in, one starts to feel the whole body is sort of expanding with the in-breath. And as one breathes out, one feels the whole body contracting with the out-breath. Uh, yeah, with the out-breath. And so one starts to feel this in and out movement throughout the body with the in-breath and out-breath. And that gives one the entry to the air element. And then one will attend to motion throughout the body. So as one goes attending to the parts of the body, again from top to bottom, one feels or experiences either expansion, contraction, expansion, contraction, or subtle movements taking place throughout the whole body. And one recognizes that as the manifestation of the air element. And so in this way, one is getting the perception of the air element. Okay, so in this way, one is getting the distinct perception of each of the elements. Then at a certain point, you know, sort of at a higher level of development, one starts combining the elements in pairs so that one could take the earth element and the liquid element together, brings together the fire element and the air element, so one gets them in pairs. Then one could bring in to a pair a third element and then bring in a fourth element until one gets the perception of all four elements as being simultaneously present. Okay, and the meditation on the elements is somewhere sort of on the, call it the twilight zone or the border between both serenity meditation or samatha bhavana or samadhi meditation and vipassana meditation, or the development of panya. Because one could, by focusing on the elements, one could gain concentration. Though it's said that one can't develop jhana on the basis of the elements, but rather one will develop access concentration. But then one also uses the analysis or investigation of the body in terms of the four elements as part of the process of developing insight when one does the, what I call the, what the Visuddhi Magga calls Nama Rupa Bhavatana, that's the delineation or discrimination of mentality and materiality. So the way to distinguish and to contemplate materiality is to contemplate the four great elements. And so the four great elements is recommended by the Buddha in the discourse to Rahula, where he brings in both the internal element and the external element 
it becomes a way of developing very clearly the perception of non-self, of selflessness. Because one considers this body is made up of the four great elements and the external world is made up of the four great elements. So, for example, we take food, we have a plate of rice and tofu and ching tsai, green vegetables. Now it's external earth element, we eat it, and probably by some time tomorrow it becomes internal earth element. And then part of the internal earth element that the body doesn't want to assimilate, tomorrow it becomes <laughs> external earth element. And then we drink water, or tea, you have the cup of tea, now it's external water element. I drink it, and before long it becomes internal water element. And then the cells are always discharging the liquid waste, which gets sent down to the kidneys, then to the bladder, then it gets discharged and becomes external water element. And then the air constantly, moment by moment, external air gets breathed in, the oxygen gets extracted and sent to the cells, becomes internal air element, yeah, internal air element, and then the carbon dioxide from the cells and the other waste gases get discharged and expelled and they become external air element. So there's constant interchange, so I call this body mine, or I think of the body as I, myself. I think of the cup and the table as being just something completely external to me, but things that are external become internal, things that are internal become external. So it's all, the Buddha says, it's all to be seen as not mine, not I, not myself. Okay, at this point I'll ask whether there are any questions on, so far we've covered the balance elements. Maybe let me just finish the charnel ground contemplations, then we'll take questions. Okay, what is here called the charnel ground contemplations is a bit different from the cemetery meditations which are spoken of in some passages in the suttas where the Buddha speaks about the monk contemplating a corpse also like one day did, two days did, three days did and then in different stages of decay of course and then this is the meditation subject which is elaborated in ten aspects in chapter, I think it's chapter six in the Visuddhi Magga. In that method of doing the cemetery contemplation, the meditator is actually supposed to go to the charnel ground to see the corpse and the particular stage of decay. It was in ancient India when people were, I think when criminals were killed by this, by the state, what they would do is just take them and throw them into a charnel ground, which would be, I guess, some distance from the town or village, and there the bodies would decay. And so animals, you know, they wouldn't last in the state of decay very long because animals would come to chew them up and birds of prey would come to feast on them. And so it would be possible for monks who are intent on practicing that meditation to go off to the charnel ground and to see the corpses in different stages of decay. But in this meditation, it's actually clearer from the words used in the Pali text but here it's translated, as though he were to, to see. 
which in Pali is sayatapi, I think it's sayatapi, pasati, pasaya, pasaya, the optative sense. So sayatapi, which could also mean like suppose one were to see. So here, one doesn't have to actually go in person to the charnel ground. But one could do this imaginatively, assuming that one has some mental conception or some visual impressions of what a decaying corpse looks like. So as though one were to see a corpse thrown aside in the charnel ground, one, two, or three days dead, bloated, livid, and oozing matter. And then, this is a key point in this meditation, one compares this same body, that is one's own body, with it thus. This body too is of the same nature. It will be like that. It is not exempt from that fate, or it has not escaped that fate. And so in the other type of cemetery meditation, the point is simply to get, go to the charnel ground, see the corpse, and then meditate directly on the corpse in order to acquire a nimitta, that is the meditative sign or visual image of the corpse in a state of decay for the purpose of strengthening samadhi or concentration. Here, in contrast, the emphasis is on a reflective contemplation in order to gain some insight into the nature of one's own body and thereby acquire a sense of dis dispassion or disenchantment with one's own body. And so that's why the key in this contemplation is comparing the body in a state of the comparing one's own body with the body in a state of decay. Observing that this body, my own body, is of the same nature it also will undergo those same changes. It is not exempt from that fate. Okay, then the rest of the meditation just goes through the different stages of decay and deterioration of the corpse, from being devoured by crows, hawks, vultures, and filled with different kinds of worms, you know, these would be the the larvae of flies devouring the flesh. Then one comes to the skeleton with flesh and blood held together with sinews, a fleshless skeleton smeared with blood held together with sinews, the skeleton without flesh and blood held together with sinews, then the bones scattered in all directions, and then finally, when it comes to the corpse thrown aside in the charnel ground, blown, bones bleached white, the color of shells, bones that are heaped up, bones more than a year old, rotted and crumbled to dust. And in each case, one compares one's own body with that in that same way. Okay, now we can take questions. Okay, Papa. Engineer, and 
other hindrance when I attempt this meditation. And that is that as I go through all the body parts, I yeah. see the beautiful functionality yeah. of the yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I have trouble trying to find the responsive nature of them. Yeah. And the heart is a beautiful organ. Yeah. And so on with the whole list. Yeah. Um, I mean, we can get, we can pick on the ones that are not so attractive, but it's not. Yeah. But but it's still a difficult process that I go through. Yeah. Yeah, I understand that. In fact, you know, I've read some books or at least parts of books on physiology, and repeatedly I'm just like awed by the magnificent sort of way in which all of these organs of the body are able to perform their functions in in harmony, you know, without me having to exercise any volitional control over them. Until I read read the book, I don't know what the liver has been doing all of those years, you know, 20-something years, the liver has been doing its job and I have no knowledge of it, but it's functioning perfectly on its own. <laughs> and I don't have to tell the stomach, get busy stomach, digest, your, digest the food. You know, I don't have to tell the lungs, come on guys, in, out, in, out. But if I'm reading a book, absorbed on the computer, sleeping, the lungs are right there doing their work, expanding, contracting, expanding, contraction. And like, you know, the heart, people are complaining sometimes about the stress of modern life. Uh, nowadays we have to work like 10 hours a day, six days a week. Man, the heart is working 24 hours a day, seven days a week, every day from the day I was born. It doesn't get a day's vacation. <laughs> you know, so what I would say to that consideration is that this meditation, like, it's not passing, making an absolute, what I would call an absolutist assessment about the nature of the body, but rather it's looking at the body from a pers particular perspective for people who have a particular, like, mental kilesa or defilement or affliction, that is, who have, like, the sensual attachment to their, their own body or to the body of others or those who have you know, pride or conceit in their body. So when you just choose this aspect, the aspect of the unattractive nature of the body in order to sort of diminish and overcome that attachment that's clinging to the body. And so even the heart, though, I mean, it does a, a wonderful, magnificent job Please don't get in any way hurt or insulted. I want you to go on feeding it for another... You know, 30 years is too much, I don't want that. But you could go on for another 15, 16 years. So don't stop now, guy. But <laughs> if you take it out, it doesn't look so pretty. <laughs> I think the same is true about any any part of the body, internal part. And even if you see, I mean, I've seen on some of the websites, they have the beautiful actresses and fashion models. They'll show them the picture, photo, when they have the makeup on, then the other photo with the makeup off. And it's quite a difference between the two. And when you see this, was it and Angelina Jolie? Is that? Is that to me? Okay, with the makeup on, and you see the photo of her with the makeup off. Okay, she's a little pretty. You can't deny that, but quite a difference from the way she looks with the makeup on and. Madonna, forget it. <laughs> um, I 
who is a popular singer, Taylor Swift. There's also, she's, I mean, without the makeup, she's still a little pretty, but quite a difference when she has the fall of the makeup on. You know, so the makeup helps a lot also. So we should contemplate the makeup? <laughs> Okay, I think Barbara had a question. But please take the microphone. Yes. Um, first of all, on the on the pictures of people without makeup, there are, are uh, some videos of uh, Joan Rivers without makeup that have been on television. She had a, a real, real life series where mm -hmm. before her surgery she was talking to her daughter. Yeah. And, and, and that is strikingly different. Mm -hmm. Absolutely different. But my question has to do with that phrase and is clung to, that is in the yeah. bodily parts. Yeah. What's the significance of that? Because I'm also feeling that all of this about, um, I never t attach to seeing things as repulsive. Yeah. And I think my sense is, that the real aim is to approach neutrality, yeah, and educated yeah. neutrality. Is that is that a fair? Yeah, yeah. First, let me take. There seem to be two questions here. First, the expression that's translated "clung to" it's a little bit misleading because it's a word that originally it originally it comes from the word "upadana," which means clinging, or the verb "upadiyati," what is clung to. But it comes to be used in somewhat of a technical sense. The Pali word is upadina. It comes to be used in the technical sense. I would almost translate it as organic, that which is pertains to one's own organic body, as contrasted with things that are exist apart from one's body. So for example, if one gets a haircut, while the hair is part of one's body, it's upadina, because it's part of one's organic body. But the hair that's cut off and that sort of falls to the ground, or when we shave the head that gets caught within the razor, that is, then it becomes anupadina. It's no longer part of the organic body. Similarly, when we clip, right now the fingernails are upadina, because they're part of my organic body, but if I clip them, then the clippings become anupadina, they're not clung to. So that is the meaning of that expression. Yeah, then as far as what you put it, you used a very good expression, new, something neutral. Neutrality. But you used an adjective with it? Considered neutrality? Do you remember? Oh, educated neutrality. Edu yeah, that was very good. Educated neutrality. Yeah, so the object, as I said, is not to have this emotional disgust towards the body, but to be able to look at the body from a dispassionate perspective with that kind of neutrality. Yeah, so that the body, the ideal is not to be repelled by the body, not to be attached to the body. Some. When you went back to uh, oh, when you went back to uh, the Sutta number sixty-two, it, the, the, it sort of talks about the space element. The space element is included there, yo. How is that observed or significant, say, in or is it part of the contemplation of the elements? <coughs> Well, in the mindfulness of the body, the sutta on the mindfulness of the body, he's taking only the four primary elements, but to do a more, compre more comprehensive contemplation of the elements of the body, then the space element is also brought in. And you could see from the way the text is formulated, that this is sort of goes in agreement with the Abhidharma explanation of the space element, that it's the empty space in between, two goals, 
in between the contours of things, or the space that defines the contours of things, the space in between unoccupied, or space is the unoccupied um, areas, rather than, you call it the absolute Newtonian space, which also comes to be considered one of the elements in some schools of Buddhism, the sort of all-embracing, all-comprehensive space. But this is simply what we call the empty space, unoccupied space. So on page 529, so what is the internal space element? It's that which is space, spatial, and clung to, that is the holes of the airs, the nostrils, the door of, you know, the door of the mouth, or rather it would be like the opening of the mouth, and the aperture whereby what is eaten, drunk, consumed, and tasted gets swallowed, that would be the... Any medical? Esophagus. 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 And where it collects, that would be the empty space in the stomach, and whereby it is excreted from below, that would be the anus, or, the, or whatever else is empty, is empty space within the body. So if one wants to do even a more total contemplation, then we would bring in the space element. And uh, when you were talking about the, all the uh, 32 parts of the body, you uh, suggested going back and forth. Yeah. What is the purpose? Is that is that to see the relation between the various parts of the body? Or? It sort of develops what I call a, a mental skill in getting familiar with the parts of the body. So it's a kind of a, a, a mental agility so that one can go in forward in reverse order. And also it helps to cover each part several times. So I've also tried doing it just going from head hairs, you know, the beginning point to the last point to urine. One could also do it that way if one wants. But I think taking them in groups gives a more concentrated exposure to each part. And when one does it, of course, it should be done at a moderately, a moderate pace, not too slow, because then the mind will start to drift, but not too quickly, because then one doesn't really pick up the, a clear perception of each part. Okay, done. Do you, do you know which part to speak into? Can you come up closer? Yeah. Okay. It reminds me of scientific training in biology. I yeah. mean, initially I did nursing part, but then, you know, did uh, vertebrate and invertebrate zoology, and you actually dissecting organisms yeah. and yeah. things like that. Yeah. So you also become aware how it relates because you're studying different body systems. Comparative physiology yeah. and the human body. So you start thinking in terms of, you know, projecting your mind into yeah. other species and yeah. humans, and mentally you see the organs and everything. Yeah. So it's you get that kind of training of the elements in scientific yeah. way. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I think let us go back to the sutta because I want to finish the sutta which it, the rest doesn't really need very much explanation. Okay, so the theme of the sutta is mindfulness of the body. And now, interesting, it's interesting that here the Buddha brings in the four jhanas as if it comes under mindfulness of the body. And that is because, if you could see from the extended formula for each jhana, Starting with the first jhana, it says, after we come finish the standard formula, 
He makes the rapture and pleasure born of seclusion, drench, steep, fill, and pervade this body so that there is no part of the whole body unpervaded by the rapture and pleasure born of seclusion. Okay, then comes the simile of the bath attendant preparing bath powder so that the lick the water pervades the entire ball of soap. Okay, then with the second jhana, after the section 19, after the standard formula, he make, again, he makes the rapture and pleasure born of concentration, drench, steep, fill, and pervade this body. Then with the third jhana, okay, he enters and upon and abides in the third jhana. And then he makes the pleasure divested of rapture, that's the sukha without the piti, drench, steep, fill, and pervade this body so that there is no part of the whole body unpervaded by the pleasure divested of rapture. And then this is compared to the lotuses that are entirely, that are immersed in the water and that are entirely drenched, steep, filled, and pervaded by the cool water. And then comes the fourth jhana, so that the meditator then sits pervading this body with the pure, bright mind, so that there is no part of the whole body unpervaded by the pure, bright mind. And so each of these then becomes a mode of developing mindfulness of the body. Okay, then in the following paragraphs, the Buddha praises mindfulness of the body in various ways with different similes. This, because time is running out and I want to finish the sutta today. So you can read this on your own, it doesn't really need explanation. And then the important passage, starting with 32, where the Buddha is going to explain the benefits that arise from mindfulness of the body. So he says, when mindfulness of the body has been repeatedly practiced, developed, cultivated, used as a vehicle, a basis, established, consolidated, and well undertaken, these ten benefits might be expected. What ten? One becomes a conqueror of discontent and delight. Because one has developed this solid perception of the body, so one is not overcome by finding delight and external sense pleasures and discontent when one fail, fails to get them. Okay, so one becomes the conqueror of discontent and delight. One becomes the conqueror of fear and dread. You know, particularly, I guess, after one has done the cemetery contemplations, then one is, you know, can face, one has actually faced the stark reality of death. And so now one is not afraid of anything that might threaten this body. Then one is able to bear cold and heat, hunger and thirst, flies, mosquitoes, ill-spoken words, unwelcome words, and painful bodily feelings. Okay, then one attains at will the four jhanas, then one wields the different kinds of supernormal power. Those would really become accessible to those who master the four jhanas, and even beyond the four jhanas, the four formless meditations. So those are the powers like being able to multiply one's body, <laughs> being able to pass unhindered through walls, and mountains. So don't think if you've done a little mindfulness of breathing or a little meditation on 32 parts of the body that you could go flying through the sky, <laughs> walking on water. Okay, one develops the divine ear elements so one could hear sounds 
distant sounds and sounds in other realms of existence. One develops the ability to read and understand the minds of others. One recollects one's past lives, even hundreds and thousands of past lives. One de develops the divine eye so that one could see beings passing away and taking rebirth in accordance with their karma. And then finally, one develops or acquires the knowledge of the destruction of the defilements. And so one enters and dwells in the liberation of, of mind, liberation by wisdom that are taintless with the destruction of the taints. And then the Buddha concludes by saying, when mindfulness of the body has been repeatedly practiced, you see the emphasis here is on repetition, developed, cultivated, used as a vehicle, used as a basis, established, consolidated, and well undertaken, these ten benefits may be expected. Okay, so this is, you know, a long process, a difficult process of repeated cultivation. But since the Buddha says that one can obtain these benefits, we should have the trust that these are the benefits that come from mindfulness of breathing. Okay, it's 11.30 now. Is that why I email you questions? Excuse, oh, there was a, that reminds me, somebody handed me an internet question. Okay, let me just... Okay, in Sutta 62, space is discussed, but not mentioned in this Sutta. Why? I already dealt with that question. Yeah. Seth asked a similar question. Yeah, yeah. So we already dealt with that question. Okay, I should just mention a few things coming up. <laughs> the, I'm sorry about this, but the next Sutta class will be the first Saturday in October. That's because next weekend I'm supposed to participate in some program at the Garrison Institute. Then the weekend after that, there'll be a meditation retreat here at the monastery starting on the evening of September 19th and continuing, that's a Friday evening, continuing until Sunday, which is September 28th, and so that extends over the Saturday. And at the same, and so that's the 12th, 19th and 20th, I'm sorry, the 13th, 20th, and 27th Saturdays are occupied by other things. So the next class will be on the first Saturday in October. Let's see, 8th is a Thursday, 9th is a Friday. Is it October 3rd or 4th? 4th. Okay, October 4th. And that will be on Sutta number 120, the Sankar Upapati Sutta, which is an interesting sutta, an important sutta for all of us to learn, since it deals with how we can be reborn in accordance with our volition or aspiration. You know, instead of just drifting aimlessly and helplessly through the currents of samsara. If we're going to be reborn, we should be able to at least gain some determinate control over our, the rebirth process. So this is a sutta which explains how to do this. And if you don't come to the class and get my explanation, you'll never learn how to do it. <laughs> 
tell you the <laughs> hidden secret oral teachings which are not in the text. Secret breathing yeah. <laughs> And then also I want to remind you that for those who won't be going on the meditation retreat or who still want to participate, on September 21st there will be the very important People's Climate March in New York City. This is said to be the largest climate, act, climate action in history, which is extremely critical right now because at our present tra trajectory the climate is set to rise by 3.6 degrees Celsius by the year 2050, which would be more than 2 degrees, 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit, which is more than 2 degrees Celsius, which is actually it's ushering in disaster for the planet. And if we don't change course very quickly and very drastically, we're going to be going even beyond 2 degrees Celsius up towards 4 degrees Celsius, which means pretty much the end of human civilization as we know it. And yet the major nations and world leaders are just procrastinating, delaying, refusing to take effective action because they're pretty much all in the grip of the fossil fuel company fossil fuel corporations. And so the following week there's going to be a major conference at the United Nations called by the UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon of world leaders. And so the purpose of the march is to, in, sort of to communicate to the world leaders that it's time to take action, that the people of the world can't wait. Now if you'd like to join the march See, there's going to be a large interfaith section of the march. You're expecting 10,000 people from different faith communities to be marching. And part of the interfaith group will be the Buddhist group. So if you want to join the Buddhist group, if you give me just write on a slip of paper your email address, I will then send you the contact address, the contact email, to get the information from the organizers of the Buddhist section of the mosque, so you know where they're going to be meeting, and then you can join that section of the march. Okay, so we'll end. You can just write it on a slip of paper and put it up here. If anything, I'll just start a sheet and I'll pass it. Oh, that's a good way to do it. Okay, so now we end by sharing the merits. Oh, and let me also remind you that on November 1st, that's a Saturday, Buddhist Global Relief will be having its annual New York City Walk to Feed the Hungry. This will be in New York City, in Riverside Park. But if you're living closer to in Connecticut or closer to Connecticut, there'll be a, a walk in Connecticut, the BDR walk in Connecticut, the following Sunday, November 9th, and you can join that walk instead, or you could join both if you like. And Allison Joe, who sometimes comes, is in charge of that walk. But if you go to the Buddhist Global Relief website, all of the walks are listed there with links to the people who are the coordinators for each walk. And so if you're joining the Connecticut walk, then you could click on that link and then you'll get information, <coughs> more detailed information about the walk in Connecticut. Okay, so let us end by sharing the merits with the deities, the devas, the buddhas, the spirits, and so on. Akasata Jabumata Deva Naga Mahitika Punyanta Nanumo Ditva Chirang Rakantu Sasanam Akasata Jabumata 
Deva Nagam Hidika Punyantam Anumodipa Chirangra Kantu De Sanam Akasa Ta Chabumata Deva Nagam Hidika Punyantam Anumodipa Chirangra Kantu Mangparam E Tavatacham E Sampadam Punya Sampadam Sabe deva numo dantu, sava sampati sedia, eta vatacham hei sampadam punya sampadam, sabe buta numo dantu, sava sampati sedia, eta vatacham hei sampadam punya sampadam, sabe satanumo dantu. Sabha Sampati Siddhya Bhava Gupadaya Vijayeta To Etanta Re Satakaya Upapana Rupiya Rupicha Asanya Sanino Dukkha Pamuchantu Pusantu Nibhutin Okay, we could stand and then end with three short bows to the Buddha. <laughs> 